Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening from wherever in the world you may be joining us today. My name is Jeroen de Wolf. I am the director of the UC Berkeley Institute of European Studies and would like to welcome all of you today here in Moses Hall or on the Zoom meeting or in live stream and to our lecture on the EU strategy for the digital transformation. A lecture that is organized in cooperation with our partners from the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, as well as the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, whose Associate Director, uh, Professor um, Heather Haveman, uh, agreed to moderate uh, this event here with us um, today. Thank you so much, Heather, for doing this. Allow me to um, welcome uh, our distinguished guest um, today. We have with us uh, Roberto Viola, uh, who's the Director General of the European Commission's Department for Communication Networks, um, Content and Technology. Um, short um, bio, uh, Roberto Viola has a doctoral degree in electronic engineering from the University of Rome La Sapienza in Italy. Um, he started his professional career in 1985 at the European Space Agency and later worked for the Italian Regulatory Authority for Electronic Communication. And in 2012, he joined the EU Commission where since 2015, he is the Director General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology. Dr. Viola will speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, and after his presentation, there will be ample opportunity for Q&A uh, with all of you here um, in the room, uh, but also with the people who are following us on um, Zoom. Um, and again, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Haveman, uh, will moderate uh, the Q&A. So uh, Dr. Viola, a warm welcome uh, to the Berkeley campus. It's wonderful to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. You call me Roberto, please. Otherwise, I'd be even older. If welcome, I welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, my plan was to introduce myself and you gave a little bit of an idea in, indeed uh, nobody's perfect i have uh, a phd in engineering but then uh, uh, i redeemed myself i studied also economics and law um, but i started as a rocket scientist uh, a lot of fun when I was getting older, I was moved to be a regulator. And that uh, is a very telling story. Now, jokes apart, uh, uh, I'm today responsible for the digital department of your commission. This is the uh, European Studies Institute. So I guess you are more or less familiar how the European Commission works. If you are not, you just uh, wave and uh, I explain. Uh, so this department is responsible 360 degree for digital policies and R&D. So we'll uh, uh, manage the R&D programs of the union in quantum and uh, artificial intelligence. We are responsible for the supercomputing program, R&D in uh, cybersecurity and the policies. And this is a unique combination, which is very useful because we are also responsible. You know, we have the monopoly of pro uh, proposing legislation in the union as commission. This is a rather unique setting that uh, you have studied. So we propose all the laws about media, uh, telecom, and online platform, e-commerce, that is also, and cybersecurity. So this is also the responsibility of DG Connect. And this interesting mix, we try to manage as close as possible, specialists that understand what we are talking about, uh, lawyers, economists, try to work together as a single team. This is also what I created when I was appointed CEO of a regulator, the immediate thing I did, coming from a technical background, I made sure that um, uh, the specialist would work with the lawyers, would work with the economists. Normally, what I find is that the technical people work well with the lawyer. They are very much structured, and the economists don't work with both of them <laughs> because they simply don't believe in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, rules, uh, sequencing, and logic, uh, uh, and. Uh, but it's, uh, it's quite as important, you have to keep them very close together. Um, so uh, I will uh, fly over many things we do. Uh, you stop me if there's something really that uh, you don't understand, you'll write, you have a question on the spot, but I will do it very quickly 
intentionally than to open a discussion. I'm, uh, uh, I'm at the second lecture. I did a lecture in uh, Georgetown University on uh, Friday, and that was more uh, on a specific subject, which is uh, uh, social media, the meaning of truth in the, so in, uh, let's say, the, so the uh, social media society and uh, things like this. I'll touch on this, but it's not the, the yeah, it's more really, I mean, uh, an helicopter view of what all the, 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 are all the policies of the European Commission, the European Union, but stop me if there's something really you want, you didn't understand, you want to know more, and then we have, in any case, a Q&A uh, uh, session. So I start from this. One of uh, the responsibilities, and this is the economist to bring it, uh, of uh, my team is to measure the status of economy and society, digital economy and society in Europe. And we invented this index, uh, which is now a bit of a world reference. It's a composite index uh, where we measure uh, human capital. You see from the colors that are mapped at the past, human capital, connectivity, integration of digital technology, digital public services. Because normally you find those things decoupled. Uh, what we uh, did and then later on convinced the OECD to do it in this way uh, is to combine them. And of course the weights are a little bit, I mean, uh, uh, our, let's say, uh, assigned with our feeling and modified over time. There's a long uh, stakeholder involvement process. So now they are stabilizing. But it's a mix of the elements that uh, give us an idea how the society and the economy are doing in terms of digital. The message with this slide I want to give you is that the EU is very diverse. Uh, you have top of the league countries which are, for instance, well above the United States in, in many respects. Uh, if you take US as a comparison, US sits more or less here Near, uh, a bit above the EU average, but not too much. And then there are a group of countries which are well below the average. So one of the issues in digital policy in the EU is to manage this difference, uh, which is uh, partly an economic difference in terms of uh, GDP pro capita uh, of countries, but it's not just the GDP because you, you take countries like Germany, you take country like, for instance, uh, north of Italy is the highest GDP of Europe and still sits there. So there are also historical reasons. There are many other reasons uh, they make this difference. Dif this difference is one of the challenges of the digital policy in the EU. Now, we tried uh, over the years uh, uh, to invent, I'm moving maybe too much for the Zoom. I mean, uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. This is my Italian nature. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we try to be as much as we can holistic in our approach. So to give a sense of direction where we want to be. And of course, what we want to do is to live in the future. That's where we all want to be. And we kind of said, uh, let's look at uh, the end of this decade. Now, this uh, idea to have a decade-long strategy was published uh, on uh, February the 8th, 2020. <laughs> After 10 days, we went in lockdown. <laughs> and the world changed completely. And uh, the vision about uh, uh, how to use digital, how to interact digitally, completely changed. Uh, but this is, I mean, interesting to see uh, uh, how this vision immediately, uh, so from theory, we passed immediately to application. That's what I wanted to say. Um, so you have seen it in the DAISY index, uh, also in terms of uh, policy, I mean, direction of travel, we call it a compass. We like to navigate on this, four cardinal points to, to look at, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and uh, I don't know whether you have a preference. I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, again, a rocket scientist in space. There's no uh, specific orientation, but I would say uh, leave, uh, leave aside space. If there's something that's really very important, it's the human factor all, all over the world. Uh, you have uh, learned, uh, you, you, uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, we are into a scarcity of skills. We are more and more entering into this. 
the complexity of our society, the demands we have about, uh, I mean, whatever you think, uh, going from data analytics, uh, going into cybersecurity, going into soft skills, going into coding. I mean, there's a huge, huge gap of skills in Europe, in the United States, a bit everywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have set certain targets, and this is clearly skilling, upskilling, reskilling, new, I mean, entry into the workforce is a big priority for us. That's an issue, an important issue about upgrading our infrastructures. Uh, and when we talk about infrastructure, it's not just the pipes, the dump pipes. For us, it's a broader meaning. I mean, it includes cloud, it includes computing, it includes, I mean, uh, what in a way we call the data factories. I mean, uh, so this is really something that is very important. Again, uh, uh, a society, a functioning society, a modern society, it's resting on very modern digital infrastructure. Without this kind of infrastructure, there's no such. Sometimes I like to use uh, uh, the concept of uh, zero distance society, uh, a bit of a, uh, an oxymoron, if you like. Uh, uh, um, so the idea is you can be in Berkeley, you can be, as you said, somewhere in the world, you are in the same place, you have zero distance, as long as you have the skill to understand what we are talking about, as long as you have the infrastructure to be connected. Uh, you can be in the center of San Francisco, in the center of Brussels, in the center of Milan. If you are without the skills, you have a, a lousy connection, you have uh, no access to cloud infrastructure, you are millions of miles distant from someone else. So in modern society, the interaction and the complex interaction is not just the physical distance, it's also the digital distance. And that's why, I mean, post-COVID society, it's a zero distance society. As long as you have the quality of infrastructure, you have the skills, you have a, a, a thriving business sector and a government that functions digitally. The more you have impediments to this vision, the more the distance becomes long. So one way that we want to change the DC, you, we want to make it a distance index. I mean, so as very much in the past, we were measuring the distance in terms of physical distance. Now you can measure the digital distance. Businesses, the transformation of business is particularly complex in Europe because the structure is uh, probably new out of your studies of the European economy is made of many small uh, companies. And many of them are brick and mortar companies which are distant from digital. So it's a daunting task to go in a place where, for instance, they manufacture shoes and convince them that to be competitive, you need to step up. But the argument we're trying to use is that, uh, I mean, uh, of course you have uh, uh, a skill uh, which is unique, unique in the world, uh, you have uh, bright uh, designers, but your competitors, maybe in the Far East, will use laser scanners to scan the food, will use laser cutters driven by AI to cut the leather, and then machines to print the shoes. Uh, so if you are not going in this direction, you might be the best designer of shoes, but you will not be having a competitive product on the world market. So uh, to do that, we have invented the concept of digital innovation apps, where small companies are coming in and they can test new technology, like, I mean, 3D printing like, I mean, uh, uh, laser, laser cutting or other things, of course, machine driven AI, laser cutting, I should say they don't sorry. And uh, so these are extremely expensive things, they cannot afford it, but together in co-working, they can do this kind of thing. So we are very much trying to do this business transformation with the idea of co-siting, co-working, getting the small companies in. Governments, are. Uh, our vision is government in the palm of your head. That's what we have done, I mean, uh, with the digital vaccination certificates where we got a digital proof of vaccination to every citizen and it really worked fine. 
And now we are doing with what we call distributed identity system, but it is basically a wallet where all your attributes, uh, your native uh, digital documents, the wallet is itself an identification mean, payment systems, interaction with the government is there. Frankly, I honestly believe that Europe is quite ahead of the United States in this particular part. So if we do a quick comparison, I think we are uh, lagging a bit behind uh, in skills. Uh, infrastructure is a bit of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there are many differences. I mean, uh, in some areas, uh, Europe is better, United States is better. Indeed, the infrastructure United States is better. Digitization uh, of business in United States is definitely better, although similar problems are here in, in terms of brick and mortar companies. In government, Europe is definitely better in digitizing, I mean, governments. So these are the targets. I don't, I, I will not go in detail. I'll leave the slides. You can read the targets. Uh, again, it's, it's, uh, there are not so huge differences with uh, the political signaling being done in the United States and Europe. We want every citizen to be connected with the fiber. We want, I mean, every citizen to have 5G connection by the year 2030. Uh, we very much insist uh, on having a digital record, a health record per citizen. Today, President Biden announced that the cancer mission, we have the similar cancer mission. And I can tell you the most difficult thing of a cancer mission is to get the data and to get standardization genomics data, image data, and to make sure that uh, you have a system by which you can harvest data, you can actually understand much better certain things about uh, uh, cancer disease. Now, we are Europeans. We love principles. Uh, uh, we cannot resist to it, but I think, you know, they serve a very important uh, uh, purpose to signal to the people what is the direction of all this. Um, so what we have done together with announcing this digital competency strategy, we said that we want a charter of digital rights. in Europe, A charter that should be signed by all the EU member states, what we call the Council, or, and the Parliament, and the European Commission. So the three EU institutions signing together a charter, which is, I mean, it's not legally speaking constitutional value, but politically speaking, it's very similar. So uh, this is what we commit. Uh, uh, and we commit it, of course, by implementing it uh, through legislation or by implementing it through programs, funding programs. And uh, we thought that uh, having this kind of uh, uh, call of duty of the institutions publicly signed and presented to citizens will give a sense of ownership and direction so that digital is not just about uh, tech companies making a lot of money. Digital is something together with the green transformation. It's a societal uh, um, uh, uh, challenge to get into something better for the citizens. And of course, the whole idea, and that's uh, uh, how we sell it, uh, we pitch it, is citizen at the center of this transformation. So the charter is ready. Uh, uh, we are now in the final refinement in terms of uh, the text and will be signed, uh, I hope, soon uh, by the three institutions. And you have uh, Michael Thibault in the room, which is responsible for the charters. So if you have a difficult <laughs> question, ask me, don't ask me. Uh, Okay, so these are, this is the helicopter view of the policies, how we, let's say, blend the various things. Now we go into the various uh, uh, strand of uh, regulatory and uh, 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 legislative policies. And we start with platform. We have, uh, uh, I mean, been working for the last three years on two uh, laws, basically, that uh, would uh, regulate platforms, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act. And in the room, there's Herr de Graaf, which is now responsible for the San Francisco office, which was leading the teams. So again, difficult questions to him. <laughs> uh, so what are, what, are, what are the concerns that uh, we try to, to cure with the DSA and the DNA? Well, 
I mean, digital uh, platform, uh, large uh, companies that provide online platforms are not charity organization. They do it for money. You should never forget because, I mean, of course, they pitch it in a way, I mean, this is beautiful for you, you, you it's a nirvana thing that uh, will get every, everyone better. And this is, I think, also at the beginning of the journey, uh, many politicians believe in it. Uh, and it's partly, I think, frankly, true that the transformative power of online platform got us probably to a better place, probably. I mean, uh, judges are still out there to, to decide on this. But the point we should never forget, uh, which was a bit, I mean, uh, difficult for certain politicians in Europe and United States to get to, although it's so obvious, is these are tremendous money-making machines. We are talking about the largest companies of the world. So if you sit uh, and program uh, a platform, uh, algorithms, what is your main objective in terms of uh, optimization to make money. They will never confess it so bluntly. I mean, uh, but this is what is uh, uh, the purpose of the exercise. And you tell me, if you want to make money and you want to attract people's attention, is it more juicy, something which is not that real, really scary, like a movie, like, I mean, there's a gigantic plot, the European Commission doesn't exist, the reality are Templars, so they came and uh, now they are secretly injecting chips in uh, the brain of people through vaccines. This is a story that circulated widely on the internet. Eh? Uh, this is juicy, no? This atrocity. Or my lecture to you about you, this is really boring. <laughs> so, when you program the algorithm, very much like a blockbuster movie, you look for this. You look for attention. And, uh, I mean, you might say it's not my fault, it's AI fault. You might say, I mean, uh, look, I'm really doing my best. If people want to really search for the strange things, it's not my fault. Whatever, it happened. And this bias that has been introduced in society, I hate this information always been around. I mean, uh, but in this massive scale and these huge opportunities for malicious actors, even state actors, to exploit it against democracy, it's something really, really worrying. Uh, and that's where we thought we ought to have a matrix, we ought to have a system by which all these risks are under control and there's accountability for this. Uh, and then there are economic concerns. Uh, these days, if you are a company and you want to do business, if you are not present on Android and you are present on uh, iOS, where are you? Where are you? So there are not so many, but there are some platforms, including I mean, Microsoft uh, uh, Office platforms, where if you are not present, if you are not company, you will never do business. So we call them gatekeepers. I mean, these are really gates for others to actually do business. Nothing wrong. A lot of congratulations to the, I mean, uh, successful inventors of all these things, but it's now a societal concern. I mean, everyone must have the same chance to do business. So these are the two big concerns that led us to the DSA and the DMA. So, the DSA, the world says it all, is about services and uh, uh, it's about this idea that uh, uh, we should empower the large, especially large platform to manage their risks. That's why the system has an independent audit of uh, systemic risks. That's why the system looks to certain issues about, for instance, user rights. It's not normal to block the account of the elected president of the United States. Whatever we think, whatever, I mean, uh, is the, but it's not normal in a democracy. Uh, so even the elected president or Roberto Viola or anybody else has the right to say, I object to this. 
and there must be, I mean, uh, at the end of this path, uh, the rule of law, the, the rule of democracy that decides about this thing. Because, I mean, the platform themselves are saying, this is the place of democracy. This is, I mean, uh, community rules are made that everybody can participate. So we take the world for real. That's why, I mean, the system of the DSA is appeal mechanism. You can appeal against the removal of content. You can appeal against uh, the blocking of an account. And there shall be a statement of reason. And there shall be also dispute resolution systems which are cheap, simple. Because of course, you can always go to a judge, but I mean, would you really do it? It's a very expensive exercise. And protections of certain categories of users, especially for instance, kids. So DSA uh, forbids targeted advertising to the kids. This has been a huge discussion. I mean, many uh, um, civil society uh, uh, organizations wanted the, the ban of targeted advertising, no matter whether they're adults or kids. I'm saying, I'm as an adult, I'm allowed to do stupid things. Uh, so if they target me, Roberto, buy a Ferrari, frankly, I cannot afford a Ferrari. Uh, but if I'm so stupid, I mean, to do that and uh, uh, be uh, in debt for life, I mean, the European regulations about privacy, about platform are not behavioral regulation how the user should behave. This is for non-democratic countries. They start with the idea, everybody is free to do whatever the person likes. That's why we were absolutely against a ban on targeted advertising, but all for a ban of targeted advertising to those people that actually don't have this will, I mean, the, the capacity still to decide. Uh, on online marketplaces, we have introduced the know your customer rule, like very much in the, in the, like in the banking sector, the European regulation of banking sector, the online marketplace, it's responsible to know who's actually using the marketplace, whether this uh, company is uh, not introducing uh, dangerous goods, fake goods, or other things. Uh, also, in terms of liability, we kept the safe harbor exception. That uh, it means the safe harbor companies that are providing platform service, this is the same in US and in Europe, uh, are not responsible for the content they use, unless they are told. And here in, in e-commerce, uh, of course, uh, companies like Amazon thrive on the idea of the safe harbor. I mean, because the level of uh, control on a huge marketplace is relatively limited uh, compared to the size of the business they do. But now there's been a correction, uh, which is if you advertise certain vendors, you rank them, you say Amazon choice or whoever choice, uh, and then uh, you package it and ship it as Amazon, then you are responsible. So because you are seemingly seen by the customer as part of the offer. So then you cannot claim safe harbor exemption from liability. Digital Market Act, as I said, it's about doing business on the platforms. And it's a little bit what we have, and in part what is existing in the US about telecommunication law in terms of essential facilities. Uh, we have in Europe uh, uh, something that existed in, in the United States, which is the net neutrality law, uh, rule, which is every content is equal on the pipe and should be treated equally. And why this law is there? Because the pipe is a bottleneck. I mean, the telecom company controls the access, your access to the internet. So they should not interfere. And here we are saying everybody on gatekeeper platform should have a chance. So data they handle cannot be used against them. I mean, that would be, I mean, unfortunately, it, it is the case, but th this is really perverse in a certain sense. You need to use that platform to do business and then the data is used. I see you all you looked at the watch. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, so the whole idea here is to have a set of behavioral remedies that allow companies to be uh, on the same level playing field. For instance, DMA introduces interoperability of messaging applications if the user wants to. 
to avoid that you have this lock-in effect and everybody's going to WhatsApp and there's no possibility for a startup to actually emerge. This is a technique that has been used in telecom with number portability to allow smaller telecom companies to get market share. Now we are using it for platforms. Now, cybersecurity, of course, these days, especially after the Russian aggression uh, to Ukraine, it's a very high concern. And it's the other side uh, of the coin. When it's digital society, of course, comes the risk of the cyber attack. Uh, yeah, you have the numbers, so you will have time to, to read them, but of course the numbers are quite telling. I mean, there are cyber attacks every second. What is our philosophy? It's uh, uh, to empower the public authorities, the member states, to do their job, to, do, to have a risk management framework in place, and something very important in cyber is to instigate cooperation and information exchange. Cyber criminals know no border. Uh, and one of the things that happened, take the WannaCry attack, believe it or not, it happened on Friday, it always happens on Friday afternoon. And the cybersecurity alert centers, mm -hmm. believe it or not, were communicating with faxes, not even email, faxes. So the people. I mean, the guy got uh, the information that there was an attack on all the Windows systems, on the railway system of uh, Germany, sent the fax around 7 o'clock on Friday and stayed there till Monday. In the meantime, I mean, uh, the, the US, sorry, the UK health system had been infected, uh, banking systems in Spain had been infected all around you. So, Time is of the essence, information uh, uh, exchange is of the essence. The more you know, the more you But of course, this is a secretive community. So you really have to push hard. That's why it's in legislation, they need to share. Now, media policy, uh, uh, we have the two legs of media policy. We have the regulated media, very much like in the United States. So the traditional television, what we call online services, I mean, uh, uh, linear online service. The lonely services are video on demand, video sharing platform. There are rules on advertisement. And then there's the whole story about disinformation. Disinformation that cannot be a law to govern this information. That cannot be. I mean, because if you do something like this, then you are saying that public authorities, they have the, the monopoly of the truth. As I said, we have the monopoly to propose legislation, but not the monopoly of the truth. So we will always steer millions of miles away from the idea that the truth can be regulated by law. Uh, and that's why we have uh, working uh, rentlessly uh, over the years on a code of practice. This information with the li every large online platform of the world has signed this code. We have refined this code. We have created an independent observatory of fact checkers. And we really, really try to work uh, through this very difficult path, which is to do something against this information without uh, being interventionist. Now, what we'll do, so, uh, is this one. This is new legislation that will be announced by the President of the Commission uh, actually tomorrow. This is really Terry, what we are trying to do here. The, 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 and I spend one minute more. I know you are looking at the watch, but allow me one minute more. Now, you know, we have an internal market, internal market rules, and the EU is the largest internal market of the world by size, in terms of economic size, including for teaching. So we regulate uh, the quality of bananas, we regulate the quality of apples and other products. But what about the quality of information? Is there a right for the citizens to have quality of information? Of course, the right is for the citizen to choose. But is there something we can do beside the constitutional protection, which is sacred about information? So as I said, you might say this is absolutely no go. And it's a foolish project. But you know, the consequence of having no law and this has been also, I've seen a lot of debates in US scholars over this. Having low law on quality of information means you have no powers to do something things go wrong. 
uh, because the European Commission cannot act on the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We are an executive body to act with power. There are things in some part of Europe which are not going well in terms of information, but we have no power. But even, I mean, where things are going well, and you take Mr. Bezos buying Washington Post or Springer owning Politico, perfectly fine, perfectly okay, no problem whatsoever. But we want to make sure that citizens are averted that there might be a conflict of interest between ownership and media, uh, the way media editors work. So this new media law will uh, say, I don't care which measures you can take, but in professional media, you must be sure that uh, the editor in reporting the news is free to organize the work and the journalists are free to organize the work. Of course, being the owner, you can give the business plan and the overall line. But the overall line cannot be, you've write that uh, Roberto going to Berkeley is saying a lot of foolish things about uh, the, the problems of online platforms, because this is really convenient for me. This piece of legislation will forbid, well, it's already, frankly, ethical forbidden, and it's forbidden by journalistic codes. But just, I mean, just for the sake of, uh, I mean, uh, avoidance of the doubt, this law will say there must be a separation between the ownership of media and the professional journalists. The other thing we do is protect the journalist, uh, uh, the, so the journalistic sources, because this is the most delicate thing in democracy. They get to know very crucial facts, like scandals or other things, and they must be protected more than other citizens. This will be, of course, debated. But for instance, when it comes to the reasons why you can deploy spyware or spy a journalist, uh, we have now raised very much the bar. It must be really a serious crime, like rape, uh, terrorism, uh, horrible crimes, horrible crimes. And in many member states, the list is much longer today. So for instance, aiding an immigrant to enter a country is considered a serious crime by almost all the legislations. But this could be a moral disobedience of a journalist. So can you spy the journalist because he's helping immigrants? So these are very tough things. We'll try, stay tuned, <laughs> but we really feel we need to protect the quality of media. Uh, uh, because we can, as I said, we cannot act on the truth and we will never do that. Let's protect those that are the professionals that mediate, right? of course you choose them, uh, but at least they have uh, a professional life, which is a little bit more protected. Oh, what they did. So, okay, the last point I want to touch is what to do about data. Uh, very quick, 30 <laughs> seconds. So there are issues in the modern society where you buy something, you also buy the data which are with it. Every object is connected, your car, your dishwasher. Are you the owner of the data or are you simply, I mean, getting uh, uh, a kind of kind gift from the producer of uh, the device? Now the data act tries to strike this balance. Uh, the answer of the data, you are both owners. You are owners because you bought the, the thing, so you have the right to repair it wherever you like. You have the right to exploit the data for your business or for your household. But also the producer has intellectual property rights on the data, needs the data to improve the products, and needs the data for, you know, for the safety of the product. So it's a kind of co-ownership equilibrium that you need to safeguard. Also very important that you must be able to strike uh, 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 automatic contracts, uh, what we call smart contracts with data. So basically you should be able to tell wherever the car comes near a wireless charger, we're not yet there, I will be there. Then the car automatically 
does an handshake and loads energy and pays. I mean, this is a smart contract. Uh, and now we are introducing a, a, a legal framework to have smart contracts as part of the acquis, the European acquis. I will stop here. The rest is on the slides. Uh, and now floor is yours to uh, animate the Q&A. Okay. So, thank you very much.